Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-4 task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Hello, welcome to Talking Therapy. This is Marvin Goldfried with his most esteemed colleague. Alan Francis. Yeah, I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, you are going to, one of the things I'm really interested is the trajectory of your career. And it's been so varied and so interesting. So if we could spend a little time on that. And then I'm also very interested in how your experiences with DSM and trying to get consensus uh, and kind of being disillusioned by the process of uh, at least of the method that was used for DSM. I think a lot of people will be interested in that as well. So why don't you? Well, I was really lucky every step of the way. So I didn't plan a career. It just sort of happened one step after another. And a lot of people, um, including you, Marvin, a lot of people taught me things along the way and uh, made, made it interesting. I, I was very lucky to train at Columbia uh, in New York City because it was an enormously eclectic program, mainly psychodynamic, but also we, my favorite supervisors were interpersonal. It comes through Sullivan. Uh, we had a great behavior therapist uh, on staff and I was very much influenced by him and I was lucky early on who was that? Meet Howard Hunt. He was uh -huh. one of the people who had done the MMPI, and he was an excellent supervisor on behavior therapy. We had one of the top family therapists, Nathan Ackerman. We had our own group as a group of residents, and we each did groups every year of, our, of the program. We learned a lot about community psychiatry. It was really a very rich environment. So this was also known as the Psychiatric uh, Institute or PI. Psychiatric Institute, yeah. yeah. And, and early on, I was really lucky to read amazing books. And the most important to me was Jerome Frank's Persuasion and Healing, which I think everyone should read now. And um, it, it taught me the importance of the relationship and the magic of the relationship and to be less concerned about saying the right thing at every given moment, more concerned about how we were forging a therapeutic alliance that would be helpful. Then I had an incredible experience in the army. It was just when the troops were coming back from Vietnam and everyone was terrified that because they were using a lot of heroin in Vietnam, they would set off an epidemic of heroin use in America. And so Nixon funded big drug programs on 32 army bases. And I got to start one. And what I did was, um, hire people with no training in psychotherapy. We didn't have enough money to hire people who were MSWs or psychologists or psychiatrists. So we hired people with no training. And what I did was interview about 75 people to fill 12 slots. And my goal was to get the best personalities I could possibly get. People who were healing naturally. Who how, were how did you tell? What, what criteria did you use? Uh, really good people. I mean, I, I did seat of the, so a seat of the pants metric. <laughs> yeah, it was I did interviews that would vary in length from a half hour to three hours. If, if I felt someone wasn't going to make it, it would be a pretty br brief interview for the people who I thought were contenders. And I had a lot of people applying for the job. I spent three hours with them, got to know them. And I did pretty probing psychiatric type interviews. And I came up with 12 people. Of those 12 people, 11 turned out to be wonderful. The one who was most qualified was not so good. So it was an ironic twist that the person who seemed on paper to be the best 
who had gone through all this interviewing, he turned out not to be very good. The people I hired who had no experience had a one week training program. And what I did in that program was talk about basic concepts, like the basic concepts of um, repeated patterns in life uh, happening over and over again, of behavioral uh, exposure, of relaxation, of uh, the importance of interpersonal relationships. I said, you are great therapists already. Otherwise, they wouldn't have hired you. So essentially, gonna... essentially, you were dealing back then with, with basic principles, trans-theoretical principles. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. That everything I had learned in the residency, I compressed into a one-week training course for people who had no therapy, but who were brilliant interpersonally. And we had, after that, uh, weekly sessions, supervision with the whole group. And we would discuss the problems they came up with. And they turned out to be remarkably good therapists with very, very little training because they were remarkably good people. What was wrong with that one anomaly that you thought would be good? The one guy who he thought he knew too much and he was stubborn and he did every patient the same way. And he was difficult to deal with as a person mm -hmm. for us and for the patients. And I got constant complaints about him. And, and finally, he, he chose to leave. Um, it, it was a lesson to me that you don't hire based on the resume so much as based on the person. When I was uh, involved in selecting residents later on at Cornell, I would constantly be fighting for people who I thought would be great therapists against others who were impressed by the fact that the person might have a PhD in something, um, mm -hmm. may, may have written papers, that I was very much involved with the idea from early on that, that certain people are going to be very gifted therapists and it's important to get them doing therapy. In any case, after the uh, army, I worked in a community program and this was the height of community psychiatry and the residents would be going out with the cops on domestic violence calls. Um, we had the crisis manager was a community organizer. The idea was to make the program part of the community rather than a separate entity. And I, I saw the, the best and the worst of community psychiatry because shortly after this, uh, deinstitutionalization occurred. The community psychiatry funding was taken away with Reagan. At Payne Whitney, uh, this was in the mid 70s, I got to be head of the outpatient department. And we did what I tried to do was reproduce what I had learned at Columbia. And I got very interested in brief therapy, partly because the place had long waiting lists, and I don't believe in waiting lists. So we developed a walk-in clinic so people could come in that day with a problem and that no one would have to wait for treatment because we did a lot of brief treatments. And you had a, was, it, was it a behavior therapy or a CBT therapy was a a clinic? The, the idea was that every resident would have the experience of doing a brief psychodynamic therapy, a brief uh, cognitive therapy, a brief behavioral therapy, right. and a brief family therapy. But I'm, I'm talking about the clinic at uh, that, that was the idea of the clinic that, that we would because I remember I remember visiting on a few occasions the clinic that was primarily either, and I don't recall it was Herb Fensterheim and it was either behavior therapy or CBT I don't know if that was yeah he would be York. doing one piece of it so I we see. had I, I recruited supervisors for the different schools uh -huh. and each of the residents would have a supervisor from a different school and it would. Cho the choice I made was, and I'm not sure it was the right one, was that they should get a fairly pure culture of each technique, and then they would combine it together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we managed to find a bunch of very gifted cognitive behavior therapists. We had lots of psych psychodynamic therapists. We had family therapists. And they would each have a supervised experience going through a brief treatment with someone who was expert in the field. Um, the diagnosis started, my interest in diagnosis was very late blooming. Bob Spitzer, who did DSM-3 and revolutionized psychiatric diagnosis, had previously, previously been a consultant to DSM-2 in 1968. That was when I was doing my residency. He was a sort of a friend. He was a young faculty member. He had a kind of nice casual style. We used to have lunch together. And he kept on recruiting me to try to work on his research studies. This is before he was appointed to DSM-3 chair. And I said, no, Bob, I'd like you, but I, I don't like the idea of diagnosis. I'm really much more interested in learning about what makes people tick, what makes me tick, 
I'm interested in human nature. I'm not interested in the little categories that you're doing. He was developing at that point. Check. Alan, uh, let me interrupt, interrupt a second. Was this before or after you wrote that uh, co-authored that book on uh, I think differential therapeutics? Yeah. So this, this was 20 years before. This is during my residency. So this okay, is like so, 18, so, yeah, 68, 69. Right. He's okay. A young, so, he's right. a young faculty member. He's at that point working on research diagnostic criteria interviews. He doesn't know he's going to be head of DSM-3. DSM and I'm a resident, and we hit it off interpersonally, but I'm not interested in his research. So research. even back then, you had some skepticism about diagnosis. Oh, so yeah, DSM not, not just skepticism, boredom. Who would ever want to, yeah, I would tease him. How would you want to spend your life asking these silly questions? Don't uh -huh. you want to understand the causes of these problems? Why are you settling for just describing them? It seemed like a, a, a fool's enterprise. Yeah. And I wouldn't participate. Then a funny thing happened. This is about 10 years later, in the, around 1977. I had an idea um, that maybe the DSM-3, which he was working on at that point, should include self-defeating personality disorder. And I mentioned to him, I was in analytic training at that point. I used to go to Columbia two times a week and we were having lunch. And I mentioned, why don't you put this diagnosis, self-defeating personality disorder, in the manual? And he never saw a diagnosis he wouldn't at least explore. He asked me to write the criteria to, to do a mock draft of what it would be like. When he saw it, he said, you know, you're not bad at writing criteria, but this is a terrible idea. And the reason self-defeating personality disorder was a terrible idea, rightly, was that all behavior that has a psychiatric component tends to be self-defeating. It's mm -hmm. hard to distinguish between motivated self-defeating behavior and, self and behavior that's self-defeating just because the psychiatric symptoms tend to undo the person. I, so, I have a vague recollection that some, some people... Uh, Walked at that notion on feminist grounds that it was there was a concern about it being applied to women who were in bad relationships. Exactly that right. That it would not only be um, difficult to distinguish motivational from unmotivated self-defeating behavior, but it would be blaming the victim. Uh -huh. that someone uh -huh. were in a bad relationship, instead of labeling the the terrible sadistic guy as having caused the problems, she would be. It would be like she was asking for it. That it was something right, that she right. was inviting. Now, what so year was, was that? It was an awful idea on all sorts of, well, how, all sorts how, of reasons. How many years ago was that? Or what year that was, was that? That was in 1977. Wow. And Bob was in the middle of working on DSM-3 at that point. Uh -huh. So what he so did... It was, it was during the feminist movement. Yeah, 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 exactly right. So what he did, though, was ask me to, to um, work on the personality disorders in general. So he needed people uh, to work. I wasn't interested in diagnosis. He wasn't interested in self-defeating personality, but he said, well, why don't you come and, and edit the personality disorder section? And he hadn't yet done something on narcissistic personality disorder. He said, why don't you write that? You probably know a lot about that. He agreed with my <laughs> wife that I might qualify. It was like Is that a, a compliment? <laughs> no, it wasn't a compliment. Oh, like, was it a diagnosis? Consumer representative <laughs> getting to write his own. So in any case, I got involved in doing the personality disorder section, writing the final draft of that. And he also made me the liaison between the DSM task force and the psychoanalytic groups, the American Psychoanalytic Association and the American Academy. And I was supposed to negotiate uh, what was happening. The psychoanalysts hated DSM. Uh, because they realized correctly that by focusing on surface symptoms, the more inferential behaviors, unconsciously um, influenced behaviors would be minimized and that descriptive psychiatry would start replacing dynamic psychiatry. This was happening anyway. All the new chairs of departments were more biologically oriented and uh, they were eager, if they could, to save as much of psychoanalysis in DSM-3 as they could. There was a stupid battle over the word neurosis, whether it should be included or not, without going into details. The word had very little to do exclusively with psychoanalysis. It's a term that was coined in the 1730s. It's been used all around the world to describe moderate level symptoms. But this became a, a, a huge struggle, whether to include the word neurosis, not include the word neurosis. DSM-3 
did certainly hurt psychoanalysis, but the problems that psychoanalysis had were endemic and DSM-3 was more the result of those problems rather than the cause that the lack of reliability in analytic terminology and the uh, lengths of treatment were major and, and the excitement of sometimes hype about biological psychiatry were undoing the hold that psychoanalysis had held after the war. From 1945 until about 1980, psychoanalytic theory and practice was a major driving force in American psychiatry. That ended coterminous with DSM appearing in 1980, but DSM was just part of a, a much larger trend. Well, they, think, they, you know, it was, it was um, touted that um, DSM got cleansed of psychoanalytic theory that you know, ran through the earlier versions, uh, at least on Axis 1. But Axis 2, is, isn't that psychoanalysis, Axis 2? Well, DSM, younger people won't even know what Axis 1, Axis 2 means. DSM 3 had a remarkably good innovation that was wiped out by DSM 5, and that was the multi-axial system. Uh -huh. So Axis 1 for, was for all of psychiatric diagnosis except for personality disorder. Personality disorder was given a separate axis so people would pay attention to it. It was, it was a wonderful thing at the time, largely ignored later. Axis 3 was for medical illnesses that might be pertinent to the treatment, very important because a lot of psychiatric symptoms come from medical illnesses or from side effects of medication. Axis 4 was a rating of stress and Axis 5 was a rating of function. This is a much better way of, of, uh, of doing things. Spitzer claimed that the diagnostic system was atheoretical and that if you were a dynamic therapist, if you were a cognitive therapist, if you were a behavior therapist, you could all use the descriptive diagnostic system as a first step. And that it wasn't biased toward any one of the different schools. That turned out not to be true. And many of us knew at yeah. the time it wasn't true because the symptom-based diagnosis with careful criteria sets and thresholds much more geared to cognitive and behavioral approaches and to medication than it is to psychodynamic psychiatry, which was more geared towards inferential, right. more unconscious, less um, obvious and surface symptoms. Well, the whole notion of personality disorders comes from Freudian's, Freud's theory of personality development and, and fixation at different stages. It maps yeah. on, not 100%, but, but quite a bit. Yeah. Dependent. Yeah. A compulsive. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 and I think one thing that's not well known is that although Kraepelin has given credit for the DSM system, Kraepelin worked, this is a German psychiatrist who developed the, um, a tech, the most powerful textbook in psychiatry that influenced the field from the 1890s and, until now. But Kraepelin only saw inpatients. And at that point, psychiatry was limited to inpatients. Freud brought in the whole world of outpatient practice. His patients were all outpatients. And so the contribution of Freud and the people around him to understanding and describing depression, um, phobias, panic disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, the sexual disorders, and personality disorder was at least equal in importance because they were dealing with the presentations that we mostly see these days in outpatients, whereas the Kraepelinian system was restricted to inpatients. In any case, we, we discussed and almost began work on uh, what was to be a uh, project to, to, to add case formulation to the DSM. Now, when so you say we, who, who was involved in that? Spitzer and I were mainly involved uh -huh, in it. Uh -huh. so, the idea was we had this huge book that was discussing diagnosis, but he, I realized he a little bit less so, but he realized too that the diagnosis would only be a small part of the interview and that people would have to know what to do next after the diagnosis. And I was also already interested in differential therapeutics and thinking about writing a book on differential therapeutics. How do you pick which treatment for which person? So we, we plotted out an outline and we even began recruiting authors to have for 
each of the major schools of thought, the dynamic, the behavioral, the cognitive, the family perspective, and co even community perspective, how you would do a, a formulation that would be added to the simple diagnosis and that would assist in future tr treatment planning. Mm -hmm. um, the project never got off the ground. We oh, all got, yeah. I was oh, lazy, yeah. I was busy, lazy, distracted. It was an enormous project. It would have been very difficult to do. I don't know, that really sounds like an, ex I, I, w when patients tell me, well, I didn't do it because I was too busy and too lazy. I usually think, well, that's the reason they're giving themselves, but maybe there are other reasons. Guilty is charged. So what were the other reasons? Do you have any in, in retrospect? I think I was, um, I had a job, well, I mean, you'll, you'll think these are excuses. I was finishing my analytic training and beginning to teach at the Analytic Institute. I was teaching the Freud course. I had two young kids. I was working ridiculous hours and um, I was bored with anything to do with diagnosis. And this seemed to be an enormous new task. And I was, I really was too tired and lazy to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, but I think the pertinent to our audience, I think the lesson I got from this was that this experience with diagnosis is that it is very important because you can have the exact same symptom pattern, individual symptom, but depending on the context, both the other symptoms the person has and the social and economic uh, triggers in their life, that same symptom can mean very different things. That you can have a uh, symptom of depression that's part of the worst possible psychiatric problems in the world that are going to require ECT. But that same symptom can be part of a very mild condition that's transient and the result of the person losing the job or having a romantic disappointment. And then if you just focus on individual symptoms without considering what are the other accompanying symptoms and how severe they are, and also what's the social situation that's led to this happening, then you sort of narrow down and get too blind to other possibilities. I worked in emergency rooms a lot, and I saw how often symptoms that seemed to be primary were due to um, head trauma or um, brain tumors or um, most, more, much more commonly substances or medication side effect, and that you can't just focus on the patient's presenting symptom without thinking of possible causes that, that might be missed and that might be tragic medically if they're missed. Right, or, or poverty, social living conditions, lots exactly. of other things. Exactly, so, and the community so I think that, that I had think an Einstein where we actually did lots of home visits and we saw where people lived and we heard, we smelled the, the garbage in the hallway and we heard the loud noises and occasionally gunshots. It gave me a, a sense that you can't ever feel that you understand someone just based on a diagnosis. But on the other hand, you can't feel you really understand them if you haven't considered the diagnostic possibilities. And I think one of the unfortunate uh, uh, practices with research on clinical trials is that sometimes people try to take a package therapy like cognitive therapy and try to apply it to people who are depressed under those circumstances, just change your thinking. And from a clinical point of view, I can't, it's incredibly naive, and yet some studies like that have been funded, believe it or not. Yeah, and, and I guess the overall sense of that experience from approximately 1967 when I started my residency through the early 80s when I was more teaching than learning at that point, but still learning, was that you can't be inflexible and you have to keep learning. And the, if you have a hammer and you're looking for nails, you're going to be very reductionistic in the way you see patients. And they're going to look right to you, but they won't be right if you have a broader context. And that if, if you miss the economic problems in the person's life, you miss the medications they're taking, you miss their medical illness as a cause of trouble, then you're doing a disservice to the patient, that they deserve to have a clinician who's alive to all the things that make uh, people have troubles. I also realized that treatment isn't for everyone. And I, one of my favorite papers was in, I think, 1981 or 1982, was no treatment as the prescription of choice. 
that in, in the clinic, I was seeing patients who got worse in treatment. I was seeing patients who were stalemated in treatment over many, many years. And when treatment seemed to be a way of hiding from life. And so we wrote a paper to describe situations in which maybe the very best recommendation was stay away from us for a while. We'll, we'll see you in two months. We're not oh, wait, was it tri treatment or was it a specific kind of fit, specific therapies that were not relevant to their issues? It was both. So, so I think for some people, being in treatment itself either provoked symptoms or let them hide from the behaviors outside the treatment that they needed to be doing. So many patients would stay in long-term treatment because it allowed them to have the excuse, I don't need to live my life, I'm in therapy. I think, I think you know, one of the problems we have, which I've always lamented about, is, is we, we deal with words. So by saying treatment, I think you're really talking about therapy as usual because advice giving and behavioral changes, while it's not therapy, can be therapeutic and can be treatment. Yeah, I see that as treatment, by the way. It's a big debate now on Twitter. I, I see everything that's therapeutic as treatment. I see yeah, advice yeah. giving as treatment. I see support as, as, as therapy. So I think we, sh we shouldn't underestimate the powerful need many people have for supportive therapy. And, yeah, and, and I think I think as a, a remnant of the meaning of therapy over the years, um, the meaning in certain circles has stayed the same, but the actual practice has changed radically. So the old label um, may not fit. And some people have said, let's not call it therapy. Let's call it intervention, which is a more generic term. But um, I'm not quite sure that I go for that either. L listen, and we're running out of time, but there's something that, that I really was dying to hear from you. And that was um, your experience with attempting to get consensus with DSM. Um, and I know that you've very briefly told me about how you were disillusioned and all. And I don't think, I think that that may be worthy of, of, a, of a separate uh, podcast. What do you think? Well, I, uh, we have about five minutes. Go into it briefly, and then we could discuss it more later. It makes sense. Okay. Method of doing DSM-3 was to bring together a group of experts, have them sit in the room, shout out possible symptom criteria for a given diagnosis. Spitzer would be at the computer typing like crazy. There'd be a huge pastrami lunch, big deli lunch. People would get tired. They'd be less passionate after lunch. Spitzer would come in with a set of criteria. There'd be a little bit of back and forth, but less. And that would be it. And then people who knew him best or who were most prestigious in the field who kept talking to him, getting his ear, might be able to slip in changes along the way. It was a very casual process, not based on scientific literature, because in 1980, there was almost no scientific literature on diagnosis. What I tried to do with DSM-4 was to reduce the change in, changes in the system. I felt, felt that changing the system frequently would be um, destabilizing and confusing, that adding new diagnoses usually cause more harm than good, that people never thought of the unintended consequences, they always thought about the benefits, that experts were not trustworthy in their recommendations about diagnoses because they had pet diagnoses that they would push forward, and most experts never worked in real practice. So what might be useful for them in their specialized research clinic may be terrible in primary care or in regular yeah. um, outpatient practice. Well, well, you know, you use the term that, that rang a bell with me and also elicited an emotional reaction because I was in, in a one consensus conference that I went to, there was a lot of shouting. You're talking about shout out. And if people don't shout, then their views may not have as much weight. That's exactly right. It, it doesn't sound like science to me. It sounds like writing a script for a movie. So what we did for DSM-4 to avoid the DSM-3 experience, and because there had been more literature accumulating because DSM-3 facilitated scientific studies, was establish a very rigorous method at the beginning with three stages. One would be a very thorough review of any literature. Before any meetings, we'd have a very thorough review of any literature that would be widely distributed and critiqued. The second was we got funding from the MacArthur Foundation 
to do data reanalyses that people would do studies and you've had this experience i'm sure more when you do a study you spend years collecting the data and then you don't have time to really analyze it so you, the five papers come out of it 10 papers come out of it but lots of the data is never really analyzed so we gave money to people to analyze questions that were specific to the dsm4 process where there wasn't sufficient literature but where they might have data and then we did nih gave us two million dollars for field trials so that we took the suggestions and saw how they would play in the field yeah. the idea was to discourage changes and to ensure that any changes that did occur were based on a substantial and compelling the way i put it to the people working on it there were about a thousand people working on dsm4 I, I, okay i have to confess i'm having trouble processing this because I'm looking at the clock and I have a patient in 15 minutes. Okay. So why don't we, <laughs> so, but why don't we, why don't we pick up on this and I'll let maybe the okay. next topic could be something like how do we forge consensus? Sounds good. Because that applies both to DSM and it applies to your efforts to forge consensus, consensus in psychotherapy. Love it. Okay. Have a See good one. See you next week. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.